so um, I'll start by sharing my screen. And I mentioned to some of the people here already that um, uh, hmm, I don't understand why it's doing that. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so we're, we didn't quite finish with lesson three. Um, and so I've loaded the R script for that, and but we'll proceed on into lesson four and there's no way we'll get done with that. Um, I'm not like really concerned about keeping up exactly with the schedule. Um, I'd rather take time and make sure people have time to ask questions and things like that. So if you want to you know, load the R scripts, you can um, click on this, uh, click on the raw button, select all and copy, and then go back in your RStudio console and create a new script and paste the data in. So I've already done that, and you may want to do that for both of the scripts because um, we'll jump right on into the second, the lesson four script after the lesson three one. So um, can everybody see my screen? Is it big enough? Is it good? I tried to make it big. I'm using my large monitor. Oops, clicked the wrong button. Um, I'm using my large monitor, so um, I am. I've hopefully made things big enough for you to actually be able to see. Okay, I've got the chat back up. All right. So last time we were talking about factors, and um, and saw an example of kind of a dumb experiment where you were um, trying to grow seeds at different levels of, uh, of water. And what we saw was that when you create or turn something into a factor and then look at either, um, either have the console print the contents of that um, data structure, or if you go over to the environment and look at it, you'll notice that when something is a factor, it always tells you what the levels are like here and also here it says factor with two levels. If it's just simply character strings, then you see um, a list of strings like you would with any other kind of vector. So um, that's how you can tell whether something is a factor or not. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I kind of glossed over when I was talking about importing data from CSV files into data frames is that if you use sort of the regular CSV uh, importing function that's like built into R, it will automatically turn any string uh, value. So any columns that have strings in them will automatically be turned into factors. Any columns that have numbers will be imported as numeric vectors. So if you don't want them to be imported as factors, then you have to do something special. Um, and it turns, I mean, this seems like kind of a weird behavior, but it comes out of the fact that when R was originally built, it was oriented very strongly towards statistics. And as we'll see in a moment, um, having factors is one of the important ways that we indicate how we want R to do the statistics that we're doing. Um, since R has sort of branched out away from statistics and into other things, there are people who just don't care about factors. And so we'll see as we go into the next lesson that there are ways that you can read data in and just, if it's a column of strings, you can just let it be strings and not automatically turn it into factors. So whether you actually want things to be factors or not depends a lot on what you want to do with it. If you want to do stats and also certain types of plots, um, they have to be factors in order for the, those particular functions to work correctly. The other thing is, and again, I sort of glossed over this, but when we were um, doing these imports of files, let's see, uh, okay, I don't remember where that was, but basically if you create a, um, a data frame directly out of vectors, um, then it will automatically turn them into factors if they're strings, just like it does with the CSV files. Okay, so what I want to do, um, the la uh, 
I guess this is actually the next to the last thing in this lesson is to look at an example of an actual experiment. Um, the earlier example when we looked at the scatter plot was where we had one variable that was, uh, we had two variables that were both continuous and doing a scatter plot and a regression was the logical thing for that. In this case though, we're going to have discontinuous data. So this is actually a real experiment that I did um, when I was teaching biology. Um, it's called an, a cockroach electroretinogram. It basically involves um, sticking two wires in a cockroach, one in the cockroach's eye and the other one in its head. And then um, you, shine, you put the cockroach in the dark and you shine light on it. And the electrodes basically measure the uh, ability of the cockroach to detect light. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at this example um, in this lesson, and then we will also look at it again when we start talking about um, the structure of data in your data files, which is the first topic on lesson four. So um, if you're in the lesson three script down in line 149, this is basically going to read the data in. Um, from uh, the internet. So we go ahead and do that. If we click on it to see what it looks like, we can see that um, one column has the color of light that we shine on the cockroach's eye, red or green. And then um, this is the number of, volt, of millivolts of the response of the cockroach's eye. So if the, if the roach can see the color really well, there's a high voltage. And if it can't see the color very well, it's a low voltage. And so what we would like to do is to kind of um, visualize and also analyze the data to find out, does color actually make a difference? There's a third column in here, which we'll talk about next time, but we're not using it in this analysis. If you have columns that you're not doing anything with, that's fine. R doesn't care. It'll just ignore them unless you make use of them. So um, the first thing that we want to do is to try to create a bar, a bar chart to be able to compare the size of these two things. And to do sort of like the um, most basic bar chart in R, you have to group um, the data of a particular kind. So for example, we wanna look at the average value for red light and the average value for green light. So there is a way you can do this with a function called tapply. And what t apply does is it applies a particular function uh, to a vector, to all elements in a vector, and then groups them by means of whatever that function is according to some other vector that's a factor. Okay, so in the example here, um, the uh, data frame, let's see, I got rid of that. Um, we can't see it from here, but the color got read in as a factor and the response got read in as a um, vector of numbers. And so this notation here is for the, the, uh, the voltages, that the response of the eye. And then this is the color, which is gonna be either red or green. And since it's a factor, that essentially allows R to group all of the numbers that have the same value for that factor and then take the average or the mean of them and then create basically an output table of that. And then the first, um, the first uh, argument that we're passing into the function is uh, the numbers that we're actually going to use in the calculation. So if we go ahead and run that, then we see that the output is a data structure called a matrix, which we haven't really talked about that much. It just basically shows you the two factors are green and red, and it gives you the average for green, and it gives you the average for red. And a matrix is the kind of data structure that you have to pass into a bar plot in order um, for it to be generated. So if I just go ahead and say bar plot and apply it to that um, matrix of values, then over here in the um, output window on the right, you can see that it did in fact make a bar plot showing me red and green. 
It turns out there's an easier way to do this. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, oh, sorry, I guess I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Um, so one question that we, well, sort of an obvious question, we can see on the, based on the output of this plot that green is higher than red, but is it significantly higher than red? And so the most basic statistical test to do on this kind of data is called t-test of means. And so this is how you set up a t-test of means. So um, in a t-test of means, you can tell it the source of the data. And if you do that, then you don't need to use this um, data frame dollar sign column notation. You can just simply list the names of the columns and then tell it that those columns are coming out of this data frame. And then these other two things are sort of technical details. Um, this is the kind of t-test we're doing. And then this is using the standard 0.05 criterion for significance. So you can sort of, you can gloss over those. But as we did in the case of the, where we were analyzing two continuous variables, we had this um, convention that the first thing that you put is the, um, the dependent variable, and then the second thing you put is the independent variable. So basically you put what you want to be the y first, and you put what you want to be the x's second. And that's how it's oriented in this graph. The x's are the colors, and the y's are the numbers. And that's the same convention we use on the scatter plot, except that instead of having categories in the x, we had another numeric value. So if we go ahead and run the test, um, we see down here that um, it did the test. And the main thing that we're interested in is the p-value. It's way less than 0.05. So that tells us that, um, that the cockroach actually does see green light differently than it does for red light. And this um, also gives me the category averages, which should be, yeah, they're the same as what we got when we did the t-apply um, function. So there's another um, extension of this, which is an ANOVA. And in, I'm not really gonna go into ANOVA because it's a more complicated statistical test, but it also uses a linear model in the same way that we um, did in the regression. So linear model is kind of a general thing. And you can see that, um, uh, that we create a linear model just like we did in the last example, and then we can run the ANOVA. So I, if you're interested in um, getting further into that, uh, you're welcome to run through that, but uh, in the interest of time and not glazing over people's eyes who aren't interested in stats, I'm just going to let you try that on your own if you want. So um, one of the things that we did see in, in all of these things, linear model, and um, also t-test and, and in plotting that we use this general pattern with the tilde that we put the dependent variable first, a tilde, and then the independent variable. There is actually one more thing. Let's see, where was that? Uh, hmm. Well, somewhere in here, I was having it. Oh, okay. I think it's just this plot value here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read in um, a different file, which has three different colors in it. Let's see, where is that? It's this one here. And then um, if I tell it to plot that, then I get also a, a plot of the three different colors, but instead of getting a bar graph, I get a box and whisker plot. So it's a fairly straightforward to get a box and whisker plot by just simply putting the um, dependent variable tilde, the independent variable, and then say plot. And because the independent variable is a factor, it knows to put it, to separate it out by categories. And so this is sort of the normal convention for blot, uh, box and whisker plots. Um, you can see that the, uh, 
well, these like the confidence intervals don't uh, don't overlap for red and green, so we know that they're different from each other. So anyway, it's the same interpretation you normally make for box and whisker plots. Okay, so uh, that's kind of all. I'm not going to go any deeper than that in the statistical tests. Um, what I do want to do is take a minute and um, take a look at um, the uh, schools data set, which I think we looked at a little bit earlier. Um, oh, I guess I should also ask, did any, does anybody have any questions about um, factor, what I talked about in terms of factors and the t-test? All right, well, I'm gonna continue on then. So let's go back to um, the, uh, the school's data, which we looked at um, earlier. So I'm gonna go ahead and load that, uh, load that and then remind you what's in there. So um, it has the school name, the school ID, and then some other stuff like zip codes and different things about the number of students that are in each grade. So you can recall that um, because the school names are, um, are strings, then they or character strings, then they're going to end up getting read in as factors. Um, so that might be good or that might not be good. Um, the zip codes, which are numbers, are going to be read in as numbers. Now, one of the things we might want to think about is, is a zip code a number whose size has meaning, or is zip code really a way of dividing things up into categories? Um, does anybody have a, any thoughts on that? Should zip code be a number or should zip code be a factor? It should be a factor. You're right, I agree. It should really be a factor because you basically it's a way of dividing households up according to where they are geographically. Like if you have one zip code that's twice as big as another one, that doesn't have any like any meaning in terms of the size of the number. So zip codes really probably ought to be factors. Um, so the um, let's see, let's try. Um, doing some calculations on this. So remember last time I said that um, you can, that when you uh, refer to a column in a table, that's essentially the same thing as referring to a vector that contains all the numbers that are in that column. And because this table has the same number of rows in every column, then if I go over here to where the male and female column is, um, then I can essentially do, like if I want to do some kind of pairwise operation on every value, because they have the same number of rows, the vectors that I get out of those columns will have the same number of items in each of the vectors. So I can do any kind of vector opera uh, operation on those two columns, and the output will be another vector that basically has a, a set of numbers that are in the same order as the source data. So one thing that, th that this table does not have is it doesn't tell me the total number of students um, in each school. And so, but I can quite easily figure that out by just saying the male column plus the female column, and then the output, which is total students, will be a vector. Uh, basically, the first item in the vector is going to be the sum for the first row and the second item will be the sum for the second row and so on. So if I go ahead and run that, I can see over here that I have um, like 847 and 266. That corresponds to the sum of, uh, oops, let's see, the sum of the first row and then the sum of the second row and so forth. So now that I have the um, total number of students in each school, now I can have a more meaningful analysis of the other things that are in the, um, 
table. So for example, if I wanted to um, know like what fraction of students were white, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to like analyze the raw numbers because like if there are gonna be more white students in a school just if the school is bigger than if it's a smaller school. What I really wanna know is the fraction of students that are white. And so I can, now that I know what the total number of students is, I can just divide the, the column for number of students that are white by the total number of students and that will give me the fraction. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now let's um, try making a fraction of the students who are white by zip code and see what happens. Okay, so if I look at the answer here, um, like what do you think about this graph? Think about the fact that I said right now R is considering zip code to just be a continuous number. And as we were discussing a moment ago, it's not really, it doesn't really have a meaning as a number, it's really as a category. So when I told this thing to plot the fraction of students that are white by zip code, it's doing an XY scatter plot. That's not really the right kind of plot. It would be better to do a bar chart, right? Or a box and whisker chart. But R decides on the kind of chart, like when you do the plot function, it decides on the kind of chart based on the kind of data that you use for X. And so if I want this to do either a a bar plot or a box and whisker plot, I need to make the zip codes be a factor rather than being a number. Um, and so I can, I can see, in fact, if I, um, I lost my run button here. If I run this, I can see that the zip code is just an array of numbers and the school names are factors. Um, so if I want um, the, so it, it really, so as we said before, it doesn't really make sense to say that a zip code is a number when it really should be a factor. And it kind of doesn't really make sense to say that um, schools are um, factors because really they're just labels for the school. We don't really want to have a factor with 169 different layers. Like that's kind of silly. Every single school is a different factor. It's not useful because it doesn't categorize things. So these two functions here, um, the factor function takes something that's not a factor and turns it into a factor. So we can make zip code be a, va a factor this way. We can change the school name from a factor, which really doesn't make sense, into just a, a vector of characters by using the as character function. So let's go ahead and run those. And now if we display what is zip code and what is school name, we see that zip code is now a factor with, with 26 levels because there are basically 26 different zip codes represented in the data. And if we ask about school names, instead of saying that it's 169 different factors, it says that it's 169 different string values for that row, which makes a lot more sense. So now if we go back and run the plot with the zip code factor, you can see that the plot makes a lot more sense. It's a very busy plot because there's 26 different zip codes, but essentially, it's not treating them as if they were a numeric factor. It's just simply saying these are categories. And this isn't like a really great visualization, but it does tell you something about the diversity in schools within Nashville, because you can see there are some schools that have extremely low percentage of white students, whereas there's other schools that have an extremely high percentage of white students. And so with this particular box and whisker plot, we can't do anything very sophisticated. But in two lessons from now, when we talk about ggplot, which is the library that is the best one for doing visualizations in Python, um, we'll see some better ways to do more sophisticated visualizations than this. Okay, so um, that's uh, this, the main purpose of this last example is to basically get across the point that 
it matters whether, or at least in some cases, it matters whether you make things be factors or vectors. And particularly, it affects the kind of plot that you get. It also affects whether a statistical analysis will work or not. And so um, if you're going to use R for stats, this is going to be very important to you. If you're not going to use R for stats, you're probably not going to really care that much about what I just told you here. Um, so with that, does anybody have any questions? Um, so does it make sense to you what, I, what we did here in terms of making zip code being a factor instead of a vector? Does anybody have questions? Cool, I see a thumbs up. That's awesome. All right, so I'm going to charge ahead then, and let's go on to, uh, oh, by the way, there are some lessons here, uh, uh, homework down here, which is essentially just practice for you. It involves uh, some data from the World Bank on women in development. It's a pretty interesting data set, and I've loaded it into our GitHub repo, so all you have to do is click this line to read it in, and then there's some, uh, you can try some playing around with it. And the answers for the quote unquote homework are listed on the lesson web page under lesson three if you uh, want to check yourself out. But I'll, I'll leave that to you to try on your own. All right, so let's go on and jump into lesson four. So um, let's see, actually, I think there were some PowerPoint slides that I, okay, we already basically talked about this. Should these be characters or back or factors. So let's get rid of that and jump on into the next lesson. So the general topic of this um, is what Rachel was asking about before we actually started the lesson, which is like, what do you do if you have several different data sets? Maybe they're in different CSV files. How do you combine data sets? How do you turn data from the form that it's in now into the form that you want it to be in. Because in some cases, in order to perform visualizations or calculations, there's a very specific format that the data, ha the data have to be in, in order to do that. So um, in, the, in the script this week, I have put some uh, references in here. Um, so, one of them is the book by Hadley Wickham, which is called R for Data Science. And it is free. The whole book is available online for free. Um, you can also go through the library's O'Reilly um, subscription and look at like a PDF of the print version of the book. Um, but I actually recommend just going to the web version because um, since it's not a PDF, it's really easy to just copy and paste out of the examples if you want to try running them. Um, so just for context, Hadley Wickham, who is the author of this book, is, I don't know if he's like the CEO, but anyway, he's one of the big wheels in the company that makes our studio. So obviously he's very influential in that way. The other thing is that, um, that Hadley Wickham uh, is sort of one of the advocates of tidy data, which is the first topic that we're going to talk about here. And so he's developed a bunch of packages for wrangling data and for visualizing data. And, uh, and those packages are combined together in one huge package that's called Tidyverse. So if you install and then load Tidyverse, you essentially get all the packages that we're going to talk about in the rest of this lesson all at one time. Um, I actually broke my R Studio and I can't get it to install Tidyverse. So it's also possible to just go in and install the individual um, libraries that you need separately. And so I have listed them out here separately. But if you load Tidyverse, like down here where I say library read R, you don't actually have to do that. If you load library tidyverse, it will automatically load read R plus a lot of the other libraries all at the same time. Um, the other, so, so Hadley Wickham made our studio. Hadley Wickham uh, invented the tidyverse. Hadley Wickham also um, was behind, I believe, creating a new sort of alternative data frame called a Tibble, 
And we'll talk about how those are different from normal data frames in just a moment. And then the last thing that he did, which is also super uh, important, is that he's one of the guys behind ggplot, which is the topic of the entire next lesson after this one. So clearly, Hadley Wickham is a big deal in the R community and, and very influential. So that's how you can access his book. The other thing that I recommend is there's a data carpentries lesson called um, Data Analysis and Visualization in R for Ecologists. And the section called Manipulating Data is going to actually go through a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about today. So I kind of regret that I haven't done a lot of practice exercises, but if you want to practice with things beyond the examples that are in the code that I give you, I recommend that you go to this data carpentry lesson and that um, will give you some other examples from the field of ecology. So hopefully that will um, be helpful to you. So um, I mentioned this idea of tibbles. So all of the packages in the tidyverse operate on tibbles, which are essentially a special kind of data frame. So a tibble is a data frame. But when you read in data from a CSV file or somewhere else as a tibble, it does not do the thing that I described to you earlier when you normally read, in, when, when you read in a CSV file using the generic read CSV function. Because remember I said in the generic read CSV function, all columns that contain character strings automatically get turned into factors. But in the tidyverse, people generally don't care about factors because the tidyverse isn't particularly statistically oriented. So it turns out that um, the read R um, library has its own function called um, read underscore CSV. It looks almost like the read dot CSV that we used before, except um, that read underscore CSV is a, is a package that comes out of the read R library, a part of the tidyverse. So if we go ahead and read in the same data that we were looking at last time, um, and you, um, so you do that for, uh, oh, let's see, I should actually, let me clear this out here first. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead um, and read in that data frame and then read it in as a tibble. Oh, I forgot to, sorry, I needed to run this. Okay, now I can read it in. Okay, so, you know, it looks basically the same, 72 observations of three variables for both of them. But if I do the str command, which I mentioned before, basically tells you information about the form of a data frame, you'll see that they actually come out quite different. If I look at ERG data frame, it has, um, it reads in A, B, C, and D as factors, and it, re and it reads in the levels blue, green, and red also as factors. But if I look at the Tibble version, it, they're not factors. It's simply a character vector with the, with the strings A, B, C, D, and a character vector with this. Um, and so it says here, you can see that here, it's characters, characters, and then double precision numbers. So whether you read in a CSV file as a generic data frame or as a tibble basically depends on whether you use read dot CSV or whether you use read underscore CSV. Um, and then I'm going to also, um, just for reference, throw in a couple more things here. There is also a write CSV file, which you can use to write tibbles to CSV. Um, and there are some examples which you can read about here at this URL. So um, that's just a, a little bit of uh, basic information about um, tibbles versus data frames. So everything that we're basically going to do from here on out in today's lesson is going to involve using tibbles. So the stuff about whether um, particular columns get read in as factors or not are irrelevant because tibbles don't automatically read things in as factors. So I'm going to clear this out. I'm going to clear this out. 
and let's talk about tidy data. So um, just coming back again to um, the electroretinogram experiment, which I explained before. Let's talk about the experimental design a little bit here. So there's essentially two factors that we have in this experiment. The one factor is the color of the light. So um, it could be red, green, or blue. But the other factor in the experiment is the individual cockroach. There were 24 different individual cockroaches that got measured, each in a different box with lights shining on them. And we probably should expect that every cockroach is not going to behave in the same way, partly because the cockroaches are different, but also I had to implant an electrode in their eye. And if I didn't do it exactly the same way in every eye, that's also going to cause the results to, um, to vary as well. So these two factors I'm going to call color, which has levels red, green, and blue. And then I'm going to call block the individual roaches. And I call them uh, A, B, C, D up through, I think, X or, uh, yeah, I think up to X. Yes, A through X. And then there's one measured value, which is the response in volts. Now, if you think about this, let's say you were working in the lab and you were going to write this stuff down in a lab notebook or maybe you wanted to put it in an Excel spreadsheet. What would be the logical way to do that? Well, the first thing that would come to my mind would be to just make a table like this. In your table, uh, you'd have one row basically where, or you would have it set up so that each row was a different cockroach. And so I'm labeling these lines in the table, A through X. And then I just have a column for each of the each of the measurements that I made on the cockroach. So each cockroach got measured for blue, green, and red light. So I have a column for blue, green, and red. So that totally makes sense in terms of, that's probably the easiest way to write it down on a, like a piece of paper or to put it in Excel. Now, of course, there's an equally valid way that we could do it like this, which would be to say, okay, well, let's think about it as each column is a different cockroach. Um, and then the rows can be the colors. So if I set it up this way, then I would, as I did each experiment, I would go down the, in the columns and I would do the, the first column for the first cockroach and then I'd do the second cockroach and so on. So it's maybe a little less convenient because it doesn't fit on the page as well. But I mean, there's not really any reason why one is necessarily better than the other. Now, this is where we get into this concept of what's called tidy data. So tidy data is actually a buzz word. And as I mentioned, Hadley Wickham, is our, who is the R guru, basically came up with this buzzword. And it has now circulated around. Everybody loves talking about tidy data. So what do we mean by tidy data? Well, in tidy data, basically each variable must have its own column and each observation needs to have its own row. So in this case, the variables we said were cockroach, the, the, the block, the cockroach, and the color. And then uh, each observation that we make is in its each row. And then each of the things that we measure is in each cell in the table. Um, so what does that, uh, oh, I, and I should say, like, I'm kind of, um, cynical about buzzwords because um, usually they, they mean something is trendy and that kind of turns me off. But the other thing is that tidy data is not a new thing. This format that I'm talking about is actually the format that a lot of statistical software has required for years. So um, Jump, which is the software that I grew up on, um, requires it. And we always called uh, organizing factors in this way, putting them as grouping variables. So group, basically tidy, da tidy data means to organize your data according to grouping variables, but everybody loves using that buzzword, so we'll go ahead and use that as well. So um, let's go back to the cockroach data. Oh, by the way, I put a link in here to videos if you want to watch how you insert an electrode in a cockroach eye. If you're into gross stuff like that, you can go to my YouTube channel and see that. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and read in this data as a tibble and then view it. 
Okay, so here's what the data looks like. But basically, the data looks like the way I described as we would put it in an Excel spreadsheet or a lab notebook. If we want this to be tidy, there is a, um, a method that we can call called pivot longer. So the way pivot longer works is it um, basically uh, gathers together, uh, or I guess I should say it collapses the columns here and puts all of the uh, number values that you collected in the same column. And then instead of having the, the um, column headers being the, uh, each of the things that you measured, you create a separate column where the value in that column is the kind of thing that you measured. So the plot ID remains as its own column, but we collapse these columns uh, of data into one and we use the column headers as another one of our columns itself. So sometimes people call the tidy form long because the tables tend to be really tall and the notebook form that we talked about wide because we tend to have more columns since we have a column for each one of the things that we're measuring. Um, and then this is generally the format that you use for pivot longer. Um, you, you take the name of the tibble, and then you say, uh, you, you explain what the columns are by creating a vector that has the column names in it. And then names two is the, what is the name that we want for this new column that we're um, gathering together the column headers in. And then the values, which are the, the numbers that we measured, we have to say what we want to use for the column header there. So these are the column headers we want. And these are the column headers that we're going to collapse. Okay, so if we do this with the um, cockroach data, I have set this up. So here's, um, so I'm using pivot longer and I'm going to use my ERG tibble. And then my three columns are red, uh, sorry, blue, red, and green. And I want to take those blue, red, and green. Uh, columns and put the column headers in a new column called light color. And then all of my numbers that I measured, I want to put them in a column called response voltage. So if I run that, um, uh, why can it not find? Oh, let's see. I forgot to load tidy R. Okay, there we go. Let's try again. Pivot longer. Okay, now uh, let's see here. Here is my new table that is tidy. So you can see here it, the color. So the block is AAA, BBB, CCC, DDD. And then the colors go blue, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red. So essentially what I've done is I've said in the other table I had a row of A and a cop column of B gave me the value of this. Now I just essentially state what the values are for the block factor and the light factor and then the value. So this is tidy because each factor in the experiment um, or each variable in the experiment is, its, is in its own column and then each observation that I made is in its, is in its own row. Um, now um, we can, um, if we wanted to, um, let's see here. If we wanted to, we could take a um, data that's tidy and reverse the process and basically make it into a wide table again. And the way that you do that is that you use a function called pivot wider. And so if I run that, and then look at what the wide table looks like. It's basically reversed the process and turned it back the way that I want. So why would you want to go back and forth like this? Well, I mean, realistically, if you think about, like, let's say that your job is data entry. It would be a pain in the neck to have to do data entry in this tidy format. It's way easier to type the numbers in this way. Um, but you can't really analyze the numbers this way. So being able to switch it from the wide format to tidy 
and then back again to wide if you want to give it to somebody to add more numbers to. Um, both of those are actually fairly uh, useful things to be able to do. Um, okay, and then uh, if I wanted to save the results of this uh, wide uh, version that I made, maybe I want to save it so that someone can um, uh, you know, give it to them as an Excel uh, or they can open it up in Excel and type in more numbers, then I can use that write CSV function that I mentioned. Let's go ahead and try that. And let's see, what did I call it? Wide ERG data. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, here it is. Wide ERG data. And there it is, kind of small. But uh, so basically, I've turned it into a spreadsheet that I can now go in and type values in. So this is a, a useful thing, especially if you like generate data using R and then you want to get it out in a form where other people can use it. Um, and then I'll let you just go ahead and try this. This example shows um, uh, if you put the table in the other way that I showed you, where you put the colors and the as the rows and the individual cockroaches as the column you can also use um pivot wider to to turn it in that direction so now you can see i took the uh the tidy data and transformed it in that way so you can basically make it go from any of these forms that um that i talked about going back from one to the other there is, in fact, uh, an older function that you'll see in some uh, examples uh, called gather and spread. And uh, so basically pivot longer replaces gather and pivot wider replaces spread. Uh, they both basically work. And I'm not sure you know, why they felt it necessary to create a new function. But apparently pivot longer and pivot wider are the preferred one, so that's the one that uh, that I showed you. All right, uh, okay. I think this is like really an excellent place to stop. Um, so we haven't really gotten into um, the dip the diplier package, but um, we'll start off with that next time using the school's data, and um, so. Uh, what we'll learn is how to pull different bits out of tables, how to pull out particular rows, and then we'll end up with learning how you can take two different uh, tables and merge them together. So we'll start with that on the next time. Um, does anybody have any questions about what we talked about and uh, anything you want to ask about? Oh, I see here. Love your lessons, hate cockroaches. Yeah, I have to say I once lived in a duplex that was overrun with cockroaches, and I don't particularly like them either, but I guess that's one advantage of using them as experimental subjects is people don't really, um, uh, people aren't very fond of them. So it's, I guess they're better with using them than something like cute puppies or something. Um, okay, is there a good way to learn how to load packages that fail? I can't get tidyverse to load. Um, so um, I don't know, you know, like I said, I couldn't get tidyverse to load on my computer, on my uh, R Studio, and, and I have never been able to figure out why. So um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to help you. When were you able to load like tidyr and readr as separate packages? Because that may just be a, a solution or, or an, an alternative workaround to loading the whole. Um, okay, readr failed too. Maybe what we need to do is just um, set up like a, I, I actually have to go to another meeting now, but maybe if you want to email me, we can maybe set up a Zoom, um, 
Let's see, tools, install package in Studio is another way to install. Hmm. Okay, well, that's a good suggestion. I don't know. I, I have to say I don't really have a good answer for this, but if anybody wants to uh, set up a Zoom session with me, I'd be happy to like share your screen and, and see if we could uh, troubleshoot this. So let's just, um, I guess, leave it at that. I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the recording. And